I'm Lily Madwip, and there's a monster wearing my dad's pajamas. We wager you did not foresee our paths crossing again, little oracle, says the monster. His name is Astyanax. I remember the last time I saw him. He had just gone through a door into someone's bedroom, and then worms came out of his head, and then there was a dog. Not a dog coming out of his head, but just a dog in the room. And a shotgun. The dog didn't have the shotgun. There was a man with a shotgun. It's a long story. I barely remember most of it as it is. I'll have to write it all down in my journal before I forget everything. Why are you in my dad's pajamas? I put up my fists for a fight. They're small fists. I'm a small person. I wish I had my knife on me. Even a butter knife would be nice. He tugs the pajama pants up because he's so thin that they keep threatening to fall down. I don't want to see that. Nobody would. I really hope he's still wearing that diaper underneath. I don't think he or anyone else from Snakebutt's dungeon got to bathe regularly. Adults need to bathe like ten times more than kids do, because once you hit a certain age, you just sweat all the time and it smells like rotten eggs. My dad is going to have a fit when he sees this guy in his pajamas, especially since he's full of worms. Maybe that's all he is. Just a pile of worms in a human suit. We were freezing. He replies, like, that's it. You just show up at someone's door wearing their dad's pajamas and shrug it off because you were cold? I could understand if my dad gave him the pajamas, but my dad would never give this guy his pajamas. What did you do with my mommy and daddy? How did you even get here? It feels like he walked off on our little group of survivors just a few hours ago. Let me think. Faced Hecate, got in a knife fight with the school bully, Angel showed up, more Angel showed up, Everything fell apart, and we fell through space, landed on a beach, surfers got decapitated. And then a car ride home. I'm like 95% sure that the door he went through didn't lead to my house. That one had a dog and a guy with a shotgun, and we have neither a dog nor a guy with a shotgun in ours. At least I hope we don't have a guy with a shotgun. I wouldn't mind the dog. Except that a Styanax tore that dog to pieces. Ugh, I hope my bedroom isn't full of dog parts. We came to repay the life debt we owe to you. His mouth moves open and shut. Is it him talking or the worms inside him talking? We did not think you would survive your encounter with the Witch Queen. He pauses to spit after mentioning her. So we came to tell your potter and mother of your deeds and your fate. He glances around at the empty neighborhood. We would be curious to know what befell her. Why are you talking in plural? I ask. He turns to look at me. His jaw creaks open just a little. Is he going to do his worm trick and tear me apart? Please don't tear me apart. I just got home. You saw what we really are. We thought it was safe to speak as we normally do in your presence. Only Lamia knew before you. After her mother twisted us into these... These dirt eaters. Lamia stitched together this suit from bone and flesh with which to imprison and torture us. Imagine having your humanity stolen from you, then forced back upon you in a cruel jest just so they can enact more suffering upon you. We acted as one because... Would you have spared us if you'd seen us as we are? I didn't really follow everything he said. I mean, as long as you didn't ask me to carry them in my hands, I would save a bunch of worms. Worms are wiggly and gross, but they make dirt good for farming. At least that's what I'm told. They must be pretty miserable, though, because they always seem to commit suicide during rain showers, coming out to lay on the sidewalk and then shrivel up in the sun whenever the rain stops. You are more noble than most. He tugs up my dad's pajamas again. If it confuses you, we... I... can speak as you would. Your parents are tied up at the moment. They misunderstood our... my... intentions. What are your intentions? I ask. 
make me freeze to death out here on my porch after saving your wormy lives? He still hasn't explained how he even got here. A Cyanax makes a sad face. I wonder how the worms are able to control the body. Do they tug on his brain like puppet strings? Is there a brain? Do they wiggle around under the skin and just give the appearance of emotions? It's too many questions and I'm still out here in the chilly night air. I'm sorry, he says. They say, whatever. Please come inside and get warm. We walk inside. My house is toasty and I've missed it more than I realize. I want to cry and hug the couch, but that'd probably come off as weird. Upstairs is my bed. I'm ready to just go collapse in it. Somewhere, my parents are tied up too. I need to hug them as well. After untying them, but maybe before untying them too. So many emotions, I don't know what to do. So I just go limp and fall to my knees in the entryway. Stianax steps toward me with concern. Are you wounded? I'm exhausted, I tell him. We will fetch a pair of your father's pajamas for you. I have my own pajamas. He nods and starts towards the stairs. No, I don't want my pajamas either. I just want my mom and dad. A Stianax comes back and stands near the kitchen door. I can smell coffee coming from inside. Normally, I don't like the smell of coffee, but smelling it now reminds me that I'm home. Inside the veil, everything smelled old and musty, like a bookstore or under Nana's bed. I hid there once, under Nana's bed, not the bookstore. You can't hide in a bookstore unless you're a book. I almost forgot what home smells like. Kind of a mix of mom's executive perfume and dad's Irish soap. And coffee, of course. My room smells like pomander. That's this thing where you take an orange and stick cloves in it and then hang it somewhere like a little pine tree in a car. I like to make pomanders, but mom said it's a waste of oranges, so I had to stop. The one in my room has been hanging there since I was six. All the cloves fell out and the orange is just this shriveled little gray lump. We are... No, I am sorry that I had to tie them up. Your mother and potter. Stianax rubs his arms nervously, a strange tick for worms to have since they don't got arms. When I told them of your battle with the Witch Queen, they accused us, me, of abducting you. Your potter threatened us. Our first instinct was survival, but that would have been a poor showing of our gratitude slaying your parents. So we tied them up. I get up and lug myself over to the couch. Sweet, soft couch. I pet its arm and hug it, and then flop down on the cushions and look at a Styanax. He seems confused. Shoot, I knew hugging the couch would look weird. Maybe now he's thinking hugging the furniture is a ritual in my house. So you tied up my parents, then borrowed my dad's pajamas, and... What? Waited for me to return? You thought I was dead. How did you get here? And how long have you been wearing my dad's pajamas? Time works differently in the veil. Ono told me that. At the time, I thought she meant that we could be gone for hours and it would only appear like minutes. Maybe it meant minutes in the veil would be like days out here. She never bothered to clarify. Ambrose has been in the Vale for years, and he seemed to think it was still whenever he came from. Astyanax seems to go limp. His jaw hangs open and there's darkness inside. His eyes stare off at nothing. I can see the worms inside him wriggling around in his throat. Maybe they're having a meeting. A worm meeting. After a minute, the wriggling stops and his eyes swivel back toward me and his mouth clamps shut briefly. Knowing your name was enough. Everything that lives and wriggles beneath the dirt is our own kin. We spoke to them and through them we found you. Your home is well known among those of us who feast on the dead. What's that supposed to mean? It took us a long time to get here. We did things that are best left unspoken. We would say that it took 
days to get here. And then within hours, you show up. It would seem that Clotho smiled upon us when she spun the thread that is our fates. Something feels wrong about this. I try not to give it away to the worms with my face, but I'm pretty expressive, so I think about it while studying my feet. When I first saw Astyanax, I thought he came to murder me, but he says he came to repay me for freeing him from Snakebutt's dungeon, even though when he ran out of my book club, he seemed pretty angry. He comes to my house and ties up my parents. I don't see how this counts as payback. So, I wiggle my toes in my shoes. Now that you said thank you, I guess you're going to go find a place to live? A Astyanex makes a face like my mom did when I showed her I had learned how to mix her a rum and coke just by watching my Uncle George at every family gathering. There is no true place for us among men anymore. If you are here, then the Witch Queen must be gone. With her finally brought down... He turns and spits again. I wish he'd stop spitting on the floor in my house. There is no way for us to be restored. We've thought about it, and will likely shed this final prison and join our brethren under the dirt. I feel bad for him. For them. I don't know what they were or who they were before Hecate turned them into a pile of worms. What if they were another one of many like me who she just brought into the veil and used in her weird plan to... I don't even know what her plan was. Make me fight her to control the veil, only there's no way to win and Samuel was behind it all the entire time or something. It makes my head hurt just thinking about it. Well, I guess this is goodbye. Thanks for not killing my parents. He smiles. It's a little gross looking because I can see things move beneath the surface of his face as he does it. I have expect a worm to poke out of his nose and in a tiny voice like somebody sucking on a party balloon say, Adios, Lily! And then wave a tiny how with a tiny arm. That doesn't happen, though. Instead, he turns to the little table where my parents keep their car keys, opens the drawer where Dad sticks the mail he doesn't like, and pulls out Pasher. Or at least pulls out Pasher's totem. The doll that I've always known as Pasher. Only at that moment, it's just a doll because Pasher the Angel is somewhere in the veil. At least I, I hope he is. Last time I saw him, he was fighting Samuel in the void before Meredith and I got dumped on a beach. Pasher! I almost squeal. I feel the strength return to my legs and I hop to my feet and run over to hug him. More than a couch. More than a bed. More than my dad, but not my mom. I want to hug Pasher. But a Stynex holds him up over his head like Roger used to do. It's called keep away, and I hate it when tall people play it with me. The worm bag puts a hand on my shoulder. Like I said, I came to repay my debt to you. I hop and reach for Pasher. Please give me my dolly. He looks worriedly at me. Are you mad, child? We need to destroy this. I freeze and stare at him. I beg your pardon? Astyanex examines the doll in his fancy black vest and drawn-on tie and nice slacks that my nana made for him. He seems upset. Maybe he thought the doll was something else. This is one of the instruments of the Seraphim. He says, Your captors and tormentors. I can sense the connection between it and the other side. Like the trail of a dove carrying messages between the living and the dead. No, that's an angel's totem. Angel, yes. He doesn't seem phased by this. Another name for the same cruel beings. They toy with us like playthings. Make us fight amongst ourselves. Treat us like experiments to do their whims. The worst of them is the lord of that wretched underworld we both escaped. He means Samuel. I agree with that part. Samuel is super stinky. I hope he gets stuck in that void and never gets out. I don't care what the dog angel said about him being important to things. The veil can be his grave for all I care. The worm man grips Pasher's head in his other hand, and he twists it, apparently thinking it would rip off. 
but it's plastic and not fully attached to his neck, so it just squeaks and twists around. Roger once twisted his head off completely. Mom put it back on, but she's never been one for toy repair, so it's been crooked ever since. Oh, I cry. Please don't do that. His head is a sore spot. Styanax clutches Pasture by the torso and legs and tries to snap him in half, but his legs just bend at the sockets. He's clearly getting frustrated. Accursed thing! He hisses, then glares at me. I'm freeing you from them. Don't you understand? Nothing good ever comes to anyone who messes with Pasher. Roger threw him out a car window, and seconds later, he was tasting the metal of a truck grill in his face. My dad hid Pasher from me, and he ended up getting stuffed in a trunk and getting put in a coma. I don't know if the doll is cursed like a mummy's tomb or just weird luck, but it's happened enough that I just take it for granted now. Mr. Xanax, please. I don't want to sound like I'm threatening you, but you're going to have a real bad time if you don't give me back my dolly. His eyes bulge in their sockets and his mouth drops open. Are you threatening us? I throw my hands up in exasperation. I just said I wasn't doing that. His jaw goes real loose and then his eyes roll up behind the lids and the top of his head flips back. I can hear the sound like someone pouring out a giant bucket of wet spaghetti. It's the worms. Whoa, I yell. Whoa, let's not do that. Everything gets still for like half a minute. I know because I started counting my last seconds in my head. One, two, three, and I got all the way up to 32. I count kind of slow, though, because I got to think the word 24 over and over, and that takes time. All I can hear is the worms in his head slithering about, maybe discussing whether to leap out and rip me to pieces. Are they having a worm mutiny? Maybe not all of them were grateful I freed them. Maybe some of them think gratitude only goes so far. I don't think any of them are thinking about my warning because the worms in his hands are straining to snap the plastic doll in half. I know the best they can hope for is pulling his arms and legs and head out, but I can just put all that back in once he's gone. I hope that's all he does. Worm friends? I swallow the lump in my throat. That dolly is the totem of Pasher. He's, uh, the Watcher of Elizabeth. I try to remember everything Pasher said to Hecate. It all seemed very important at the time. I should have paid attention. Stewmaker of the casserole and one of the seven potatoes. I'm pretty sure I got everything wrong there. The top of Astyanex's head flips back over with a nasty snap. His eyes roll back down and blinks at me. What does any of that mean? I have no idea, but he's very important among the angels, and that doll is his totem. He's put a... a... a curse on it. The grip on Pasher loosens, and he looks down at the toy. One of the legs of Pasher's pants is ripped at the seam. Dad's going to have to sew that back up. A... Uh, curse? I nod and move slowly towards him, holding out my hands. Anyone who tries to destroy it suffers terribly. Believe me, I've seen it happen. He looks at me, and then at the doll. Do you trust me? I ask, moving another step closer. I can almost feel the soft felt of Pasher's clothes on my fingertips. A Styanex turns toward the sliding door to the backyard. He looks out at the trees and bushes and grass like something's distracted him. After a moment, he turns back to me, his skin wriggling all over with the worms inside him. The dirt eaters that reside on your land spoke well of you. He says calmly. See? They- wait, the worms talk about me? I stop. The worms in my backyard talk about me? Like, gossipy talk? What do they say? He holds out pasture to me. They say you are a friend to us, that you have kept them well fed. The worms said that? Oh, cripes, they are talking about all my dead pets. I can't believe the worms are happy they get to eat all my poor babies that we buried in the backyard. That's so wrong. This bizarre conversation is interrupted by the sound of shattering glass. It's the sliding door to the backyard because something super big just got thrown through it. The big thing is like a giant sack of potatoes. It hits the ground with a wet splat and what looks like one of those 
tumbleweeds you see in a western movie and wildy coyote cartoons rolls across the floor and stops between a Steinax and me. The tumbleweed has a face. I recognize it because I just got done taking a car trip with it and a talking dog. Its name was Mortimer, or as I like to think, Santa? I scream. I hear Meredith's voice from outside. Lily, run! Run and we'll peel your little friend like a grape, comes a voice. Only it's got a funny accent because it sounds like Rune and whale pale your little friend like a grape. Two dark forms step through the broken glass door. It's the Crispies, Snap and Pop. They're still wearing the wetsuits they stripped off the surfers. And one of them has Meredith under his arm like she's a piece of luggage. Only she's kicking and slapping at him angrily and suitcases don't do that. They don't bite either, like she's doing to his arm while snarling like a wild animal. He doesn't seem to care in the least. People don't peel grapes! That's what I want to say, but I'm too busy staring at Mortimer's lifeless eyes. If his head were still attached to his neck, I, I, I just think he was sleepy. Instead, I just say, banana, quietly, because you peel bananas. Who peels grapes? Maybe headless ghouls like these two do. Snap brushes his hands off on his hands. They're wet with blood. We come bearing gifts, he says. But his funny accent makes it sound like we come boring gaffs. I'm frozen in fear. Jophiel said the Crispies were too powerful for me to deal with, and now they're standing in my living room, and I don't even have Pasher to help me. Who are you? Shouts a Steinax. He's still holding Pasher, but not trying to tear the doll apart anymore. He's got it raised like some sort of weapon instead. Get out of here. Yeah, that'll... That'll drive him off. Snap looks around the living room. Noise hoose. He looks at me. Onokoli sends her regards. I can almost understand him. Give us the totem. A Cyanax and I look at each other. Are we having one of those moments where two people share a thought and make a plan without speaking? Because I got nothing. I'm just trying not to pee my pants. Maybe he is too. That can be a shared thought. Let's not pee our pants. They took my Barbie! Meredith shrieks. And they killed Mortimer! Yeah, I can see that. But where's Jophiel and the doggy? Did they get away? Did the Crispies grab Meredith and Mortimer before Jophiel got back to the car? I hope the dog is okay. Snap crunches across the broken glass, stepping past the huge sack of potatoes that was Mortimer's body. I can hear the carpet squish wetly beneath his feet, probably with Mortimer's blood. We're going to have to get that shampooed out, or more likely Mom will just get it all recarpeted. I mean, if we don't all die. Someone will get it shampooed, I guess. He walks up to his Styanax. You are a fooler, he asks, jabbing a thumb my way. He grins. There's blood on his teeth. It's probably the surfer's blood. He puts his hand out. Hundred over. The Steinex casts me one last look, then turns and glares at him. Over our dead bodies. Snap smirks. Far enough. Wanna see what I can do with me, Had? The Steinex lowers his chin. Want to see what I can do with mine? Snap reaches up to grab a Styanax by the neck. I've seen him do it before, twisting a surfer's head right off of his body so he could wear it like a hat. The head he's wearing right now, in fact, because Snap doesn't have a head of his own. He's got a hand where his head should be, but a Styanax's head doesn't twist off like he planned. Instead, the top of it flops back on the jaw like a hinge. Snap looks genuinely surprised by this. He gets three and a half words out. What the bloody f- and then a thick tentacle shoots up out of a Steinax's neck. Not a tentacle. Worms. Worms wrapped around each other so tightly they look like a muscle. They glisten in the moonlight coming from outside, reflected off the broken glass all over the floor. 
the wormical pops straight up out of the lower half of a Steinex's head like one of those stalagmites you see in a cave. Not to be confused with stalactites, which are just stalagmites that prefer the ceiling to the floor. C for ceiling, G for ground. That's how I was taught to remember. The massive worm stalagmite arcs down at the top like a fountain of water and plunges into the top of Snap's head with a sick cracking sound. If it had been Snap's head, he'd probably be dead. But it's not, so instead the head just comes right off, sliding down the front of his wed suit, revealing the weird blackened hand beneath it, all covered with gross stuff. Pop drops Meredith to the floor like a sack of garbage and drops to his hands and knees behind the couch, probably poised like a tiger about to pounce. A second later, he shoots across the room like a missile. A tiger missile, I guess. Minus the head he was wearing as a disguise. The hand in its place clenched up like a fat fist. He hits a Styanax like a battering ram. The Styanax flies backward and tumbles over the coat rack by the door to the entryway. His body crumbles into a pile while the worms inside him flail out of his neck like an army of angry spaghetti noodles. I can see them latching onto the Krispies, wrapping around them like slimy bandages. And just when I think it couldn't get weirder, that's when the dog bounds into the room through the broken glass door. I mean, a dog coming inside isn't weird, but it feels so out of place with the head hands and the worms and all the blood that it seems kind of surreal to see it running in. It trots over to me and rubs against my leg. I... I pet it numbly. Lily, it's Jophiel. Take the collar. I stare at the two crispies writhing on the floor covered in worms that seem to be trying to squeeze them to death. They tear the little wriggling bodies by the tens or hundreds, but more just keep coming out of a Steinex. Why me? Why is it always gotta be me? He could have had Meredith take the collar. He could have had anyone take the collar. Why is it gotta be me? It's always me. It's always Lily. I hear Pasher in my head. Lily, take the collar. He's home. It's such a relief to hear his voice. Just makes all the horrors going on across the room seem to fade away. I reach down and unhook the dog's collar. Almost immediately, everything around me looks brighter, clearer, more colorful. It's night still, but I can see in the dark as if it's the sunniest day of summer. The glass on the door glitters like diamonds. Even Mortimer, poor Mortimer, looks less like a sack of potatoes and more like one of those paintings they have in the Museum of Fine Art in Boston. It's like he was painted with acrylics. Everything is awash in color. The worms are a beautiful pink. The red of Mortimer's blood is so vibrant it makes me want to cry. Take the others, says Pasher. My legs don't want to move, so instead I reach out with my hand and my mind. I can't see them, but I sense them. Two angels, compacted into plastic and molded into the shape of dolls. They feel me calling to them and come to me, flying across the room from their individual locations and snapping into my hands like a pair of magnets. The world is alive. I can see the nasty, shriveled hearts beating in the Krispies' chests. I can hear the furious beating of ten thousand little worms' hearts. I feel the heartbeat of a doggie at my side, and my friend Meredith lying behind the couch. Upstairs in their bedroom, my mom and dad's hearts are beating fast, frightened by the noises from downstairs. I can even see the last rhythm of Mortimer's heart in his chest. He has already been judged. The time of judgment has come. I can hear myself speaking, but it's not me. I don't think I'm saying this. It's my voice. But I'm busy thinking about how it's not even me as I'm speaking. It feels like my hair is on fire. Maybe it is. I hope I'm not burning the whole house down. It's like I'm outside my body, watching... But I'm not. I'm trapped behind my eyes. As if in response, the piles of still-living worms squirm away from the two silently struggling Dullahan. I don't know why I remember that word now. That's what they are. Dullahan. Ugly servants of death. Snap flounders on the floor, and the hand coming out of his neck grabs the decapitated surfer's head and puts it back on, then turns and looks at me. Half its face covered in blood from the wound the worms made. Woe unto you, Chian and Donaka, I say. That's their names. I don't know their names. My voice sounds like thunder. 
My own heart feels like it's going to explode in my chest. It hurts. My whole body is on fire. I raise my arms. No! roars Danica. Behold his wrath, I whisper. And then the whole world goes completely silent, even as the ceiling over our heads disintegrates and the entire room is filled with a pillar of white-hot fire that floods all my senses, blinding me. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video. Or listening to tonight's podcast on the podcast, if you're listening to that there at Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or wherever you can happen to listen to podcasts. I wanted to remind you guys also that my wife sells loose leaf tea at etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. She has different teas, including creepypasta teas, and you can get a Mr. Creepypasta tea. If you ask for a dabbing sticker, she also has those. And of course, I wanted to give a big thank you to everyone who checks out patreon.com slash MrCreepyPasta and supports the show, keeps the light on, gives me treats for my now two cats, both Hylas and Hercules. Both of them are a handful. And especially a big thank you to Haha Saha, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mazakin, Ken Lando Higuchi, Chambinsky, Nico Kao, Tristan Pelton, Stephen Van Hus, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, G. Weevil 3, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Hades Nephew, Carter Barenfanger, Dr. Strawberry, Jordan Wayne Deckart, Bradney Lipe, The Government Monitoring System, Anne Charon, Rumble Fox, Acid System, Mike Bullock, Rafael Rodriguez, Dan Sweet, Mad Marshdomp, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Sean Mills, Brian Arce, Cryptic Nightmares, Shadow Morningstar, Somber Puppet, Brianna Wright, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Bad Honey, S-Man, Kiri the Sloth, Patrick Schoolmeister, Thomas Burgett, Barbara Maceo, Bobby Carmen, Liam Newman, The Homeless Bird 93, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Last Blade Song, Eliminator 86, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, and Corey X Kenshin. A big thank you to all of you guys and everybody down there in the description. I really can't thank you guys enough for supporting the show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And everybody who listens, sweet dreams. <laughs>